Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And I don't know if you saw the interview that I did with Jerry Hall on the on the chain channel, but I had shared with everyone five of my techniques that I use to do research for these videos. And I got the nicest DM today from at J O A O 737 who actually gave my techniques a try. And he came up with a wonderful article in Portuguese originally, which is of course the language of Brazil. And it is about Ripple. And he shared it with me and I'm gonna share it with you. It is a, uh, an interview with Eric Van Miltenberg. It's about four months old. And it is really good because it's got some nuggets in here that I actually missed. Now, he's the senior vice president of global operations. I think you can say pretty much second in command. And when you do use Google Translate, yeah, it does it quite well. Um, some language is better than others, but for Portuguese, it's actually very, very good. So it says in this article that Eric was traveling frequently to Brazil and that what really stands out for me is that 30% of Ripple's transactions are actually coming from Brazil. And of course, we know that Ripple technology can lower the cost uh, and even you know, bring it from $20 to $2, as this article says. But then when you add the XRP digital asset into the mix, it's even a bigger savings. So what is interesting though, is when they got into some uh, specific questions about cryptocurrency, and I'll show you right here, that how do cryptocurrencies increase the efficiency of transfers? So for a Brazilian company to do business with Japan, Hmm. The normal thing is to open an account there and another in Brazil. And what he's talking about is when you are opening an account with the correspondent banking partner and you'll have literally hundreds of maybe 200 banking partners around the world that you are actually um, putting money into their accounts so that you have this trust factor to actually do those transfers. So as I continue here, when you transfer money, the notes do not physically leave here and go there. The bank here collects one amount from the bank uh, that delivers the other, and then the two agree. And to honor these money orders, the banks keep that money at a standstill. This is the parked capital, the, the dormant cash that, that doesn't, get utilized by the bank who puts it there and also is risking any sort of volatility in the change of currency values as it sits there and has to also hire someone to manage that liquidity that's sitting it with the correspondent banking partners it is all the pain points that xrp the digital asset eliminates. Okay, so they need to deal with the inaccuracies in an operation that can take days. That is because we all know SWIFT has a very high error rate. And then also you've got the change in the currency prices during the transfer time. Therefore, moving values with blockchain is very attractive. And he gives the example with Bitcoin, the operation, and I mean the transfer takes between 10 to 20 minutes. Ooh, I think that's on a good day. And it costs $3. With XRP, it's even faster, three seconds, and it costs 0 0.0011. So they are having a partnerships with more than 300 banks, according to this interview. And the conceptual differences between XRP and Libra I liked this question. This was interesting. So XRP is a cryptocurrency with no central control. An open source permission based ledger is what is, is uh, the protocol. And we do not command it. We meaning Ripple. We are just a big proponent with it. We don't want to threaten established currencies. And on the contrary, we want to reinforce them by increasing the, the efficiency of the bank transfers between Brazil and Canada. Hmm. So maybe a corridor that's open and 
putting ODL through there? I don't know. And I, I, meaning he's representing Ripple, do not threaten the real or the Canadian dollar. On the contrary, I enforce their importance. So I thought that was a very uh, good answer to that question. Now, if I just want to show you what's going on in Latin America, I think business is good. Hmm. Uh, in February, in March, there was actually a position. Ripple was seeking to hire a transactional lawyer to assist in strategic transactions, investments, managing deals, negotiating, and documentation in the Latin America region. So I think this is a very busy part of the world for them. And I'm still just, wow, 30% of the transactions are coming out of Brazil. It's, that's just, I can't wait to see the announcements of ODL when that happens. Another good source for looking at Brazil is on the XRP Arcade website. This is a very detailed podcast that took place in October. And it's about 37 minutes long, I think, but my favorite quote out of here is when Mr. Miltenberg says that liquidity in markets around the world for XRP is a big part of what will make our products over time successful. Mm, I like that a lot. And also on XRP Arcade, you'll find that there is the announcement of the new podcast that's coming out from David. And I just can't wait for this. I truly am excited for this um, that's going to start on May 5th. Yeah, have a, have a quick listen to just a portion of it. Hello, listeners. I'm David Schwartz, Ripple CTO and XRP Ledger co-founder. I'm excited to share that I'm hosting Ripple's new podcast series, Block Stars. Each episode will educate you on the basics of the technology and share real-world problems being solved today and what you can expect tomorrow. We'll also discuss industry topics like sustainability and the Bitcoin halving event. The podcast features crypto and blockchain technology leaders, including Binance.us CEO Catherine Coley, BRD CEO Adam Trademan, and Berkeley economist Barry Eichengreen, just to name a few. Well, yeah, and also he says that they will have Chris Larson and Brianne Madigan. Brianne, of course, is head of the institutional liquidity. It is the job that Miguel Viaz was doing. She's been doing it since May. I'm very, very interested to hear what she has to say. And Catherine, Catherine Coley, of course, was with Ripple. She is now with Binance. Uh, Adam Trademan is with the Beard uh wallet that is actually an SBI backed project and then Barry Eichengreen I didn't know who this was but I do now he is an economist at Berkeley and wow this guy this guy is tweeting superb content on Twitter so if you are a Twitter user you might consider following his feed because it's some good stuff. Now, sticking with podcasts, if you are following R3, you might be interested in following their podcast. And they just had the CEO, David Rutter, on about, about six days ago, six or seven days ago. And he's basically um, yeah, talking about how he has <laughs> adjusted to working from home. And he bought up a uh, he bought a stand up desk, and I thought, wow, I really need to do that. So, you probably like me are interested to know who is using Corda Settler and what digital tokens and assets are being created and used. So I'm going to quickly update you, just to bring everyone to the same point. In case you don't know Corda Settler, it is an open source D app that allows payment obligations to be settled via any parallel rail supporting cryptocurrencies or other digital assets, uh, providing that cryptographic proof of settlement. And it was released in December 2018, and XRP was the first digital asset to demonstrate its use. Okay, soon after it launched, there was a little problem. And that problem was actually discovered by the Toa Labs Marka 
Marcus uh, Alvila. <laughs> Alvila, yeah. Okay, Marcus, yeah. Thanks to you, you discovered there was some vulnerability in the source code. And then you can find that in the article that Thomas wrote, and he is on Twitter too. And I like him because he goes deep into XRP ledger material. And uh, he is at S-I-L-K-J-A-E-R, Silkjar, that's a Danish uh, that's a Danish name, and he is great for the XRP ledger. Yeah. So anyway, he wrote this article on Forbes. He's a contributor, and the Corda team in uh, 24 hours implemented a patch, and it was just in time because in July they launched the token SDK 1.0, and this is. This is to facilitate growth of Corda Settler, which you know can handle these digital tokens into fiat through payment rails, reducing settlement time, and of course, counterparty risk. At the time they launched this, they also announced five projects that were building their own tokens on the Corda Settler, which is an all-in-one solution. So some of them are and ex doing kind of exchange work. Some of them are tokenizations of debt and equity. Uh, there's one that is doing gold and silver trading, and then there's some securities lending. But it was in January 2020 that Corda gave three goals that they were going to work on. And one of them, you can see here highlighted, was enabling more transactions that Corda Settler would be enabled to support more transactions as well as the settlement of native tokens issued on Corda Network. And they said it was a logical step that uh, they were going to take forward because it'll speed up the adoption of digital assets and transferring value and making payments. And the one, the one project that I was really interested in following and i still am is this one that created 18 billion dollars worth of digital tokens for instant settlement uh getting that instant cash transfers and the participants are mostly banks uh dbs bank us bank national bank of canada and i and others there's 18 banks total the trial was completed and the cryptographic tokens, which according to this article from December by the senior vice president at US Bank, the um, trial has been completed. And they are, well, explaining that the tokens they created are like Bitcoin, but unlike Bitcoin, these are backed by collateral. And it is supposed to go live in Q1 of 2020, but I cannot find anywhere in my research that it has gone live. They might have delayed because of the current challenges we are all facing in this world at this time, but I'm gonna keep following this and it'll be very interesting to see um, the uh, project actually working and up and live and i think we'll all want to follow that okay everybody yeah i'm going to jump to the fluff wow the sirens are just um yeah you're, you're hearing in the background if you can hear it that's ambulance so uh there's just a lot of ambulances today uh i'm in the heart of the city so the city's always um yeah the city's always full of city noises but it seems like there are a lot of ambulances, especially today. All right, I am taking you to Fluff, which I don't know if this looks familiar to you or not, but when I grew up, there was soy sauce in these, and there was only one brand of soy sauce, and that would have been Kikoman, right? I think my mom only had one brand available for her to buy in the market. Now, I don't know, that could have changed now. I've been out of the US for 20 years, so I don't know what 
the selection of soy sauce is now whether that shelf has become wide but when you see that the uh, soy sauce container has been turned into a light this is just really funny don't you think very kitsch now i did learn this is not a japanese product the actual design is from a gentleman, Jeffrey Simpson, who is in London, and Angus Ware, who's in Australia. So what a fun item. This is the table lamp style. It also comes in a hanging lamp style. It's a little expensive. It's like, um, yeah, $450 US dollars. So it's, 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 got a, it's got a handsome price tag on it, but I still think it's very, very fun. But getting back to soy sauce, so soy sauce really became a craft item in the 1600s. It used to be a paste, and then it was developed into what we see now more of a liquid. And in Japan, the soy sauce shelves in the grocery stores are as wide as wow maybe the craft beer selection in oregon in the, in the, in the market because i always think about when i lived in oregon in the 90s the craft breweries for the India Pale Ales were really a big thing and small batches would be made. In fact, sometimes so small you'd have to take your own container in to get some of the, uh, the special batch that they had brewed. Well, soy sauce is the same here. Some of it is uh, just made in very limited, limited quantities. There are 12 hundred soy sauce brewers in Japan. And so the selection is just unbelievably wide. And I think that should you want to explore a little bit outside of the normal Kikoman world, and there's nothing wrong with Kikoman. I think it's a great soy sauce, but it's it's like um would I tell you to drink a gallo wine your whole life and never try uh <laughs> try another wine from another region of the world no of course not life is meant to be enjoyed and one of those enjoyments of course is is uh, food and all the condiments that go with it and all of the drinks that go with it so here is my suggestion while you are staying home is just to indulge in a little luxury and find a soy sauce that is a little bit more premium. And this is one called Kishibori, and it's available on Amazon, and it won't break the bank. Um, yes, it's more expensive than Kikomen, but when you taste the difference, you'll understand, and I think you'll be happy that you did. This one will run somewhere between 12 and 17 US dollars a bottle depending on the size. But I really believe that you can easily be a soy sauce connoisseur. Okay, everybody, do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.